Jason Miller is our final speaker of the day. He's going to visit with us on cropping systems and some soil health issues. Jason's a homegrown South Dakota boy, grew up in northwestern South Dakota, attended SDSU, got his agronomy degree, been with the NRCS for I believe about 23 years and in his current position about 13. So with that, Jason, one other thing, if you haven't signed the sign-in sheet, please do so. I'll just pass it around. Thank you. And Chuck, you want to hit the lights there just so we make sure we can see all these? Okay, uh, I figure I, since I'm agronomist, I should be just as well qualified to be a meteorologist, right? They're only, they're only right maybe half the time and still get paid. So I'm going to have some future moisture outlook. I'm going to cover some example available water holding capacities using the web soil survey, current soil moisture conditions, I took a little bit of that out of there just because we're running short of time. Potential annual forages, some things that you could consider um, for growing this spring. Management strategies to build soil resilience. You heard Jeff back there say soil resilience. It's something we need to really focus on to help us through some of these, these drier periods. And then I'm going to close with some just some cover crop stuff uh, anywhere from establishment to species selections, that sort of thing. This drought monitor um, map just came out last Thursday. It's for a period of April, June, and July. And you notice the green. Green looks good. It makes you feel good and wonderful, right? You need to be very careful in looking at that because just because there could be an improvement, they're saying that it could be from a D4 category down to a D3, which means no matter what, you're still dry, okay? So take that with what it's a grain of salt. Hopefully we're not. Hopefully we get those average or above average uh, April, May, and June uh, rains. Just a little quick thing here on Web Soil Survey. If you're not familiar with it, you remember going into your NRCS office or SCS office, we had these soil survey books, right? These big, thick books we handed out to producers and everyone else that wanted one. All this information is online. There is a brochure back there to kind of describe how to get into it, um, how to operate it, but I just kind of wanted to pull out just a little bit of, of information here just to kind of show you some plant available water, moisture levels, and what your soil can hold. Remember Jeff talking about, uh, you know, we poured in what, two and a half cups of water? Well, what does your soil hold? Is it, is it only have the ability to hold? This much water, is it an ice cream bucket? Is it a five gallon bucket? How much water will your soil profile hold? And this little thing will kind of, will give you a soil map. You just go around and, and trace around your field there. This is a soil map right southeast of Eureka. Has a different uh, soil types there, along with the acreages there. And I pull out a little report. I didn't want to show this one. Uh, crop productivity, let me get to the next one here. Available water supply. 0 to 150 centimeters, which would be about 5 feet. Okay, in the top 5 feet, how much of plant available water would that soil hold? Uh, the, some of the better soils out there, 10, uh, 10 inches here. The best soil out there, 57A, Bryant, Grisana, nice and deep, 11 inches. There's various different soil types, as you know, out there, and you can have from the clay pans, which is going to have about six or seven inches, to, to some of the sands, which are only going to be about seven or eight inches, somewhere around there. You need to manage those, 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 that ground differently just because if we happen to get back to normal, what are you going to do with that extra water if your soil is, is limited to how much it can actually hold? You're actually wasting it. You know, he says be, be hoggish. Take as much, uh, take all the water that falls on your ground, but you need to make sure you you utilize that and transfer it to some sort of growing crop or some sort of management option to help you with your soil health. And I'll get into that down the road here in a minute. So as I said, plant available water depends a lot on texture. Okay, that's one one item, texture. We'll talk about how much organic matter holds, but sand obviously doesn't hardly hold very much water per foot, half an inch per foot. Look at it, a lot of the soils that would be more common around here, 2 to 2.2 inches of plant available water per foot. A lot of the clays will hold a lot of water, 
not all of that water is plant available. That plant root just can't extract every little last drop out of there. That soil is going to hold on to it. Those pores are going to hold on to that specifically in the clay soils. Average rainfall for Leola, 19.51 inches. Um, April, May, June, Terry said 7.88 inches. If you look at March, 1.37 is our average long term. You've only got 3,500 to 4,800 so far in March. So we're already behind eight ball going in April. So hopefully we can get some things straightened around here in these very important months. Because we know soil moisture levels are very low. And this actually happens to be soil moisture readings from the Leola Weather Station, which is just located right in the southeast part of town. Unfortunately, it's kind of on the clay pan soil, which tends to screw around with some of these little bit deeper, deeper numbers down here as far as soil moisture. Starting back April 1st of 2011, what was your soil moisture levels? Right around 9%. We got all that rain that Terry was talking about, about mid-April. Look at that. It saturated the soil very quickly. And then it started dying down or dropping off. And yes, crops started dying down uh, throughout the year. But what does this black line here, 20%, exactly what do these percents mean? Let's convert that over to basically field capacity. 20% would be about half of that available water in the soil. You're only half full. This glass is only half full. If that soil would happen to hold, hold this amount full, you're only at half of that level. Okay, you see wilting point is down here at 13%. So we go back to the previous slide. You started out, you started out very close to wilting point last spring, which we knew we were we were dry, no snow, very low snow over the winter, so forth. Just like Terry said, those April April rains is what really carried you guys through. And to be honest with you, we're actually below those levels right now. This is uh, March 20th, we're below those levels than what we were before. Our subsoil, we had a fair amount of subsoil. Look at our subsoil, it was over half full. We're at 25%. You can see we, we max out, I'm sorry, here we max out at 27% for this particular clay loam soil 20 inches down. We're pretty much, we're pretty close to maxed out here. 30% we, we probably had more drainage water there, gravitational water that was, that was extra, but we are severely, severely dry, at least according to this weather station. Uh, I'll skip that slide. Now, what are options for you guys based on, and every operation is going to be a little bit different, and how, how you play at Vegas. Uh, do you, what table do you go to? You go to the five, the penny slots? Do you go to the $5 table or the $100 table? What is your, what is your, how do you manage risk? Um, are you going to, I talked to a producer last night about, about some cover crop things that he had last year and he actually had a stand of cover crops last year. He wanted, we talked about fertility. I go, well, what, what are you gonna manage for as far as fertility? Are you going to manage for that bumper crop or are you going to plant for, plant for a bumper crop or, or what are you gonna do? He goes, you know what, over the years, if I plant for an, for a below average crop, that's exactly what I get in the end. So he was he was positive. He was going to go for it. Um, he was going to put the fertilizer and the seed down as if it was going to be a good year. Say I can't afford not to. Some guys that are going to be short on hay. I mean, he has no cows, so this is you got to take that equation out of there. For you guys that have for, that have livestock, what else could you do if you are bone dry? If that soil moisture, we don't get that April rain, what are you going to do? I mean, these could be some options. There's a fact sheet back there from SDSU, it's at 8152. Talks about small grains, millets, sedan grass, sorghums, uh, legumes, and some teff grass. We know it's barley, triticale, and rye. Most of the time we're not going to be grazing, grazing these for the most part up here. It's more for down south, but you can graze them. I mean, you could put a spring wheat out there or an oats crop out there and graze it. Uh, these are just some levels. You need to be careful depending on what sort of residue, crop residue you're going into. If it was wheat or corn last year, you could have tremendous nitrogen carryover, which would produce some high nitrate levels. So be a little bit cautious there. But most of the time, 
these small grains are going to be mixed in with maybe some of those legumes that I'll talk about in a minute. Millets, German, Siberian, Hungarian, generally grown for hay crop. They grow in a short period, approximately eight weeks, little or no regrowth after being cut. Siberian mill is the most drought tolerant and finer stem. So again, these are mainly hay crops. We look at the pearl millet. The pearl millet is, is somewhat new to this area. It's more used as a grazing option. You can you cut it for hay. Regrowth potential is there compared just to the, the other hay millets. Sedan grass, um, you can be grazed, hayed, silage, can withstand dry periods, uh, not as drought tolerant as the millets. Regrows faster than millets and other sorghum, sorghums, but you gotta be careful of the, the prussic acid that you could get as a result of some dry conditions continuing. Sorghum sedan, more used, more often used as a as a silage or or cut as a as a hay, uh, generally not grazed just because it's it's got thicker stems compared to sedan grass. But the same concern there is, is the prussic acid. Annual legumes, the field peas, cow bees, mung beans, this is where your small grains are going to be more probably mixed in with, with the field peas. Um, a lot of the times these are hay, not all the time, but a lot of times they're hay, so you need to be looking at your pea variety and your small grain be variety being somewhat similar as far as maturities. If you do decide to hay them, they should be cut at, at specific times there to get the best bang for your buck. The cow peas, the mung beans are going to be more drought tolerant compared to your, your field peas. Generally, I've seen these mainly for the most part just raised as cover crops um, or green manure. You guys just wanting to keep that soil biology moving forward. And generally, it's a little bit further west of here where they're just planting them as a cover crop or a green fallow type, type period. But boy, the cow peas I've seen grow in absolutely hardly any soil moisture conditions whatsoever. So that may be one possibility that would that would uh, that would fit in this area just depending on, on how the spring goes. It's a warm season warm season broadleaf though both of those are the field pea is a cool season broadleaf needs to be planted early. Teff grass somewhat new it's a warm season warm season grass very small seed about four pounds to the acre is all that's needed. Seed cost is anywhere four fifty to five bucks a pound right around there. There's generally they're generally Seeds can be coated or non-coated because they're so small. It's generally easier to get the coated seeds because it's easier to monitor or meter through your drill. Um, very good quality, actually, used as a hay. Uh, tolerates a lot of different soils and environments. So I know of a producer just right down in the Gettysburg area has been planting this the last three or four years and, and really likes it. He generally gets two cuttings off of it. Now. You notice I said a lot of the word haying or grazing. <clears throat> this was a study done up in North Dakota back in 08, but it was looking at the impacts of how the cover crops were harvested in 2007. Grazing versus chopping, where they removed all the residue. The crop in 08 which was 68 bushel, compared to the, the crop on the grazing side was 91 bushel. This was, this was a field split in half, same cover crop, same previous crop, etc. It was a huge impact on removing all that residue versus grazing. So I wanted to just to point this out, what you do this year probably it may impact next year's next year's cash crop. That was a short-term thing. It was very evident, it was a very short-term thing. How does it affect long-term? Let's look at some research data on winter wheat from Dakota Lakes. And Dakota Lakes started no-tailing or started the farm down there in 1990. So it took us 12 years before we saw this information come about. You notice the winter wheat are, is placed in two different rotations, but behind the same crop, behind field peas, okay? What's the difference here? This rotation is two thirds high residue crops. This rotation is 50% high residue crops. So less organic matter is being grown and left on that surface. 2002, 56, 28, half. 2005, 90, 20, 92 versus 57, and here's 60 versus 29, and, and cut in half. That's a huge, huge deal of, of how our management is impacting that soil biology. 
The only thing I see different there is soybeans. Uh, correct. The soybeans is the only other crop in there, but the main point of it is it's 50% high residue crops here, 50% low residue crops. So it's a 50 50 split versus here, it's two, two thirds of this rotation we're producing a ton of residue. Okay? So it's that residue feeding that soil biology. In actuality, if a guy told me he had a crop growing in his rotation out of every one of the four crop mixes, the cool season, warm, cool season broadleaf, warm season broadleaf, cool season grass, warm season grass, this should be ideal. But you notice, since he's only including 50% high residue crops in there, it's, it's digging him down the road. He's but, losing sustainability. But the only difference is, correct me if I'm wrong, is yep. the soybeans. Yep, it is, it is. But it's the winter we both planted behind the field pea. Now, practices to improve organic matter to build that soil resilience to help us through these dry conditions. We just talked about some of that diverse crop rotation. We need to have a rotation that would be 60 to 65 percent high residue crops in that rotation. That means, we're, and we're going to alternate sequences. We're going to have corn in the rotation that's going to be on that's going to address an average an average year behind wheat. We're going to have corn behind soybean. We're going to have corn behind field pea to guard against that that uh, little bit drier year, but you're going to be able to have a lot of moisture saved over from that field pea year to benefit that corn. The corn planted behind soybean here is going to be a guard against that dry year. So you're going to have, instead of one, one rotation, crop rotation out there, you're going to have, have to have a multiple multiple rotations so you can have different sequences out there to help mitigate that risk. Eliminate crop residue removal. No-till with low disturbance openers. Add cover crops where possible. We need to really look at this percent of brassicas in our, in our cover crop species mixture. We've learned a lot since 2008 when cover crops, especially the brassicas, became very popular. We need to be looking at making sure we don't have no more than that 25 to 35 percent of radishes or rapeseed, turnips, those sorts of things in our cover crop mixture. And I'll show you a little bit of why I say that down the road here. No-till. Last time we did this uh, survey, NRCS and, and partners do a survey. We used to do it every year until 2004, then we quit for a number of years. But we're doing it this year, right? We're doing an updated survey, so it'll be interesting to see. But at that time, 2004, McPherson County was about half no-till. Okay, Compare that to some of the other counties a little bit further west of here. A lot of these numbers are going to be a lot higher. And I'm just shocked at Hughes County, so I, that one better be a lot higher. Um, some of these may be going backwards. Spink County, for example, 2010, 11, 12, you know, 9, 10, 11, were extremely wet over there. I'm almost afraid of to see what's going to happen to Speed County. I think that may be going backwards just a little bit. Maybe even Edmonds County a little bit. We'll see, I guess. <clears throat> it just depends on how much fall tillage was done out there last year because I think guys understand that tillage wastes water. And I think this spring is going to be a telltale sign of, of, of crop stands, whether it was no till versus no tillage. So taking that same rotation I had with that 2002 six five and six data they're looking at the winter wheat let's look at the corn impacts and how that different crop sequence of placing that corn behind the different crops will come into play here if you look at when he started when you could actually start recording data uh, for the crop rotation effect would have been 1993 remember that that rotation was started in 90 or 1990 for a winter wheat corn field pea 93 through 2001 now you bought 100 bushel of corn there. You compare that to this corn behind the soybeans here, just about the same, 98. There's no statistical differences there. However, you look at the last 10 years, how have we impacted that soil resource long term, 2002 to 2012? 72 bushel when corn is placed behind wheat versus corn behind soybean at 54.5. There's a huge difference. Again, we're only reason we, we have this rotation for two reasons. Corn, we want, we want to be able to get, make sure we get corn in early when we get 50% above average precip. This is going to be that rotation 
where we can always get that corn in early into that soybean stubble, okay? We always raise lot longer hybrids in that, in that variety in this corn plot there. The other reason we do is because we have winter wheat into a low residue crop. We generally, we generally try to shoot for the moon on our winter wheat yields here as long as we don't get winter kill. Our winter wheat yields are always going to be by far and the best after field piece in the rotation. Okay, now that somewhat contradicts my, my previous comparison between these two, but I was wanting to show two thirds versus 50% high residue crops. This corn is going to help guard against some of the dry years. We also have another rotation that I don't have up here where it's corn into two years of wheat stubble. Okay. It's, it's a little bit difficult to make an average comparison here just because, like I said, I har hybrids are different in these rotations, but they're selected to, be, to fit that rotation to the best of its ability. Okay, so some of these yield comparisons are just slightly skewed here. Organic matter and water holding. Remember I showed you that slide on soil textures and how much water just that soil texture is going to hold. How much water will that soil hold with organic matter levels. If you look at 100 pounds of dry soil with 4 to 5 percent organic matter, it can hold 165 to 195 pounds of water. Compare that to 1.5 to 2 percent organic matter will hold 35 to 45 pounds of water. That's a huge difference, but what's that? What, what, what's pounds of water mean to you? It meant absolutely nothing to me. So I'm trying to convert this a little bit more to what I can relate to as far as inches of water. For every 1% increase in organic matter, it will give you about 0.6 to 0.9 inches of plant available water for every 1% increase in organic matter, okay? So that's also going to come into play when you look at the soil textures. If you have a silt loam that's holding 2.2 <coughs> and you have 5% organic matter, it's going to be a huge increase over than just that 2.2 inches of water. What's this translating the crop yield for you? Anywhere from five to 15 bushel. It's hard, it's, it's hard to put uh, a number on that just because of varieties. When that rain falls is a huge, huge factor. Um, so this is looking at wheat to soybeans. Soybeans tend to respond at the right time in August with the rainfall. So it's, it, there's a whole bunch of factors. So there's a range there. Question? Yeah, with us, uh raking these corn stubbles and baling them up and hauling them home and feeding them to the cows. Yep. What's that doing to the organic matter? It's, it's hurting it. It's, it's so hurting it. You're well, taking off nutrients also, but yes, it is hurting the soil. So what's that going to happen in a 10 or 20 year rotation? I mean, that 10 or 20 is years. Get harder and harder and harder, and you're going to have to be putting more inputs into it because you're, you're mining those nutrients out. It's not a good deal. It's not a good deal. You need to be, if you have to do it, you need to be rotating around and coming back to that field with manure, with several high residue crops um, throughout, that, throughout that rotation to try to build some of that up. It's, unfortunately, it's not a good deal. You're a lot better off. Those cows have legs. And I, I know I grew up in the northwestern part of the state. Winters can be harsh, but it's much as possible have them out there in the field grazing versus hauling it off and taking it back to the farmstead. Uh, okay, uh, who in here, uh, how many of you guys have raised cover crops? Just so I know how much time to spend on here. A couple of you guys have? Three, four, okay, good. Just so we're on the same page, what, what is a cover crop? It's really just it's really any crop that is grown between, between two cash crops. And why do we do that? We do that for soil erosion, provide organic matter, which is a big thing, provide supplemental forage is a huge thing, fixes nitrogen, provide nitrogen. It also scavenges nitrogen. A lot of those crops, the wheats, the corns, will leave, leave leftover nitrogen in the soil, which, which is okay. I mean, you want to make sure your wheat plant out there has enough nitrogen out there for a decent protein otherwise in some years you're going to get a hellacious ding on price so i mean it's just a natural thing we're not 100 percent. that plant is not 100 percent efficient you look at a corn plant it's only of all the pounds of in you put out there it's only actually extracting anywhere from 40 to 70 percent and that's 
70% is extremely efficient for that. So there's going to be leftover nitrogen out there. So these cover crops will actually sequester some of that nitrogen or tie it up. It will tie it up and put it in a, it will, it will actually slowly release throughout the following next year's growing season. But let's take a 180 here. Before we're talking about droughts, let's get back to a normal year. What happens in a normal year in some of these fallow periods? And I just want to point out wheat to corn. When wheat stops using an appreciable amount of water, it's going to be right around that August time frame, August 1st time frame on average. It's going to stop using an amount of appreciable amount of water. Compared to when corn starts using an appreciable amount of water, it's going to be right around that June 1st by the time that corn plant gets up high enough to really start using some decent water. So my fallow period, or that period, is going to be from August to June. How much precip is available? 13 and a half inches. Remember we talked about that second slide, how much plant available water is out there in that soil. Anywhere from 9 to 11 inches, remember? Our bucket is over full. So we got enough moisture there in, in this sequence from wheat to corn, and it's even more when we go from wheat to sunflower or wheat to soybean, we can afford to utilize some of that extra moisture. That cover crop's going to take up, on average, anywhere from 1 to 4 inches. I get numerous studies of that in the fall. I don't have a lot of studies, unfortunately, in the spring. I do have a few, and I'll show you a couple of those. But uh, <clears throat> we do have some water available there for that cover crop to utilize. Now let's look at what happens in the spring. This happened to be that same study up there that I showed you in North Dakota, where they had that chopped versus grazed the year before. This is inches of plant available water down to four feet, where we had the cover, cover crop. 3.07 compared to no cover crop 3.11 this was taken on May 6 of 2008 uh, virtually no difference between cover crop versus no cover crop available water holding capacity that soil is only at 50 percent field capacity and they still rate 91 bushel corn so which to me for up there is is, is pretty good let's look a little closer to home this is actually from Redfield this is back in 06, um, April of 06, where we had cover crop. No cover crop, 10.5 inches, where we had uh, cover crop, 10.36. And most years, our soil moisture is not going to be an issue after cover crop. Normally, we are recharged at plant corn planting time to be just about dead on. And I would say about 80% of the time to 90% of the time we are at that level, at least in this area for sure. Now we raised cover crops and we started really looking at cover crops uh, really to utilize some of that excess water and this just happens to be down in the Gettysburg area, uh, north of Gettysburg and these, these soils are actually fairly, fairly heavy clay soils. But where he had no cover crop here, he ran out of cover crop seed the year before, came back, was planting. He was planting just fine through where the cover crop was the year before into the wheat stubble where there was no cover crop. I mean, look at the plant skips here. Um, and this is in the low area. This whole area here is in the low area. You see the impacts on stand. That cover crop was not growing in the spring. That, it all winter killed the year before that winter when he came out here and planted. There's something going on with that soil biology that allowed him to get across that field. He had to stop and wait about three to five days before he could actually come back here and try to get through this stuff without gumming up that planter. So there's some issues going on there, some good things going on there in that cover crop area. Any of you at all interested in cover crops need to really get this book and you can get this book at this website. You can order it, you can download it as a PDF, it's, it, you can, it's free to download, otherwise it's like 25, 26 bucks, something like that, but it's an excellent reference as it comes to cover crops. There's no doubt about it. They did it one heck of a job there. When selecting cover crop species, we need to identify the following. Objectives. What do you want that cover crop to do for you? Do you want it to provide supplemental forage? Do you want to increase organic matter? Do you want it to fix nitrogen? Do you want it to scavenge nitrogen? Most of you are going to say three or four or all those things up above. So you're going to have that cover crop mixture or species that's going to be a mixture of several different species combined together. But you're going to need to decide what that next year's crop is going to be because the majority, 
the majority of those species in that mixture needs to be an opposite crop type of next year's cash crop. And that's just mainly from a standpoint of disease, insects, etc. as far as carrying over to next year's cash crop. We don't want that to become a host for, for those issues or pests. What herbicide is going to be applied to this year's cash crop? So if you have wheat out there, you hope to put cover crop in this next fall, what herbicides are you going to choose? You need to be thinking about that now or right before you put that on because there's, there's a list um, out there that, yes, there are concerns with various herbicides out there that will carry over. If you're trying to grow, let's say, put in there some rapeseed in there, there's a number of these in the red and some of these in the, in the yellow that can cause problems with, with carryover. Because you're going to be planting that cover crop in, in August there, and it's not going to be in long enough time. Now, for the most part, I think, for the most part, none of you guys are using Maverick up here. Some of you guys are probably using some Olympic Flex and Rimfire, maybe some for some, some cheatgrass. Those, those will have some issues there. I, we've done a little bit of experimenting with Rimfire down in the Gettysburg area. Not quite so bad. Power Flex is another one right in that gray area. If we continue to stay dry after wheat planting or after herbicide application, you could have some issues. Um, Everest is one that looks like, I'm not really overly familiar with Everest, but that's one that's showing up as some damage on some of these species. Uh, Ally is pretty much out the door anymore. Husky, surprisingly, look at Husky. It's not even in the red. I have seen numerous fields uh, down in that Mitchell area have problems with husky carryover, so make sure you, you throw that one on the list. Wide match is a common one up here, and to be quite honest with you, I've looked at a number of fields across the eastern half of South Dakota the last three years, and I personally haven't seen any. I know of one producer up here, uh, Jim Shower, that actually had two fields, cover crops grown, quite a few miles apart had more rain on one field than the other and, and he thinks he had some some carryover from wide match on it but if you if you use a two-thirds rate I don't think you're gonna see that I, I personally haven't seen that any issue which you look at the label and it should be death on a number of these cover crop species but it really hasn't <coughs> seeding methods anywhere from broadcasting it in the standing crop to drilling it to broadcasting after corn silage a number of them being down, done out there. Uh, best method, obviously, is going to be that, that drilling. That good seed to soil contact is extremely important. If I look back in 2009, we had a really good wheat crop. And a number of guys planted, they happened to be somewhat sort of a wet cycle. A number of guys were planting cover crops. But really, to be quite honest with you, they were a little concerned with the small seed. And generally, with a small seed, you need to plant shallower, blah, blah, blah. Well, <clears throat> they needed to compensate for two inches of duff. And to be quite honest with you, do not be afraid to punch that stuff an inch and a half into the ground. Make sure you get it past that duff layer. And that, to be quite honest with you, is going to take some, some time from in the morning because you're going to have dewy mornings into that wheat, wheat straw. You're going to be setting that drill deeper, in the, and that's a pain in the ass. I've done it. I've set those drills deeper, run around to all those ranks and drop that down a little bit and raising it up a little bit about midday and then about eight o'clock seven o'clock at night you're going to start having to decrease it a little bit more to plant a little bit deeper it, it takes some management but you're planting that crop there for a specific purpose it's just like a corn crop make sure you do it right the first time planting date extremely important obviously the earlier plant the more production you're going to get um, I usually recommend that first week in August, right around there. I know that's pushing it for spring wheat harvest up here, and with us already being pushed back just a little bit on the later side, that August, it's a great window. It's a moving window. It's anywhere from August 5th to August 20th. I've seen cover crop fields out there in August 20th do a tremendous job. It's just, it's weird. I can't put an exact date on there, but the earlier you get out there, the better off it's going to be. I'm going over just a little bit. Uh, slide here, McPherson County, planting date August 5th, 6,500 pounds dry weight of turnips, radish, German millet, and volunteer oats. Tremendous amount of, of, of forage out there. That was put in out there after oat harvest, right? Was that cut for hay or was that combine? Do you remember? It was cut for hay. 
You're, oh, you're the guy in here? No. Okay. Chris, is that right? Yep. Okay. I'm assuming, assuming the kid's gotten a little bit bigger by now. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> More trouble? Yeah. <clears throat> so it was, did you graze that then afterwards? Yeah. Okay. Uh, going back to what is your objective with that cover crop? Is it to provide supplemental forage? You're going to want as much growth out there as possible. This just happens to be an in-row over in that Watertown area. And you know what happens to the in-rows where the guy goes around the ends there to plant? He's also fertilizing more. Look at the impacts of the nutrients. It's kind of some guys balk when I tell them, okay, what was your protein on the wheat? Well, it was a little bit low this year. It was only 10% versus 12%. That means you're short on end. Throw out there 40 pounds of actual end and you're gonna see a boost of that. So it comes back to what is your objectives for that crop? Uh, if you had a, a high protein year, you're not gonna to wanna to throw anything out there. You're gonna to to wanna to tie up some of that end to hold it for next year's corn crop. Old fence row, we see that all the time showing up. Extra nutrients in there from that organic matter that was breaking down. Another important point, control your volunteer wheat early when you're planting these things. Make sure that this stuff is, is dead before going out there planting. This stuff comes up in a hurry. I'm not kidding you. In three to four days, this stuff is gonna start poking through the ground. So make sure you don't try to risk it and seed it and then hope to get it burned off. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that that stuff, you have a good control plan there to get that burned off because a lot of these mixtures, you're gonna to wanna to maybe more than likely include some sort of grass crop out there of either millet or a small grain into your cover crop mixture. And once you do that, it locks you out of all other herbicide options to control this wheat. If you just had a straight broadleaf mixture out there of legumes and brassicas, sure, there's a number of products you can put out there to control the volunteer wheats and, and cheatgrass and so forth. Any of those soybean grass herbicides will do that. Um, here was one that was controlled very well earlier, a lot better growth compared to one that Volunteer wheat is competing a little bit too much. I don't mind some volunteer crops out there. The volunteer wheat is going to provide some forage there, but I don't want it up before the cover crop is. It's going to be competing way too much. Now, why do I say watch your percent brassicas in that mixture? It comes back to this slide. Wheat, winter wheat, corn, field pea, that three-way rotation. Wheat stubble with no cover crops. This would have been taken in 2008. We would have had 80 to 90 bushel wheat straw there uh, the year before. Look at a cover crop field where it's the cover crop was inserted after the second year of wheat. So a spring wheat, winter wheat cover crop with 100% brassicas out there. Look how bare that ground is. This is right across his, his road. I mean, it's just within 100 feet. Two years of wheat stubble in a row, you should have just a thick, thick mat. Those brassicas do an excellent job of, of breaking down that straw to the point where it's too well of a job. In Pierce, South Dakota in July, we need that straw. We need to provide, we need to protect that soil, reduce the soil temperatures, etc. And the brassica component was just way too much. We need to, that's why I say 30, 25 to 35% is kind of where I think we need to be at. You get further east, Webster area, and I think we can bump that up a little bit, but not here. 50 bushel difference where we had 100% brassicas versus none. It's, it's, it was huge that year. Huge. Another thing with brassicas, they like a lot of sulfur, so we need to, need to make sure you have sulfur in the starter or else in a side band of some, some form when you're following corn behind these brassica cover crops, okay? Go beyond T and manage for C. What on earth do I mean by T? T is the maximum annual soil loss that can occur on a particular soil while sustaining long-term agriculture productivity. T is something that NRCS uses to evaluate where your soil is at as far as erosion loss. Okay? T is at five, it's maximum amount in South Dakota. Some soils go down to two tons. We're at, uh, for the most part, a number of our soils are at five. Um, however, we need to go beyond that. We just need to, if we do everything possible to manage for C or carbon or organic matter, we are going to control that erosion just automatically. We shouldn't even have to look at that. 
that's something that we need to do a better job from our agency to focus on is to give you that full full plan that full service and not just looking at erosion if we look at acceptable soil loss of five tons an acre per year on, on a section of ground that would equal 40 semi loads of topsoil how can that be considered sustainable that's a pot load of soil in other words, by addressing conservation issues from perspective of soil organic matter, instead of erosion, we will focus on enhancing as opposed to managing for tolerable de degradation. Okay? <clears throat> by growing a proper diet or proper diversity of crops in the rotation, but also watching how we manage or how what percent of, of high residue crops in there we need to promote that organic matter increase because that really is the lifeblood of the soil okay with that that's really all I have um, this is a slide here showing of, of the roots and, and, the, and, the, and the structure of the soil this looks awesome it's, it's, it's as good as it gets type of thing and and with that I'm gonna I'm gonna close Holly sorry okay. no, I'm sorry. We didn't mean to rush you. Does anybody have any questions for what kind of a root was that that I think was a uh, this was taken from Danny Forty so there's actually either flax there, looks like maybe some syringum sedan there, there's some radish or rape there. So it was in a cover crop field. What's your uh, legume recommended? Um, I've, I've kind of shied away a little bit from the lentils just because they seemed a little wimpy. I'm looking more at the common veg and another one I'm really liking is has been the crimson clover. Um, for some reason that one seems like it's 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 fairly aggressive. It's doing well even in drier environments We've had a guy down in that pier area that raised it and, and it looked good there And I know there's some guys that further east of there in that Miller area. It, it looks good I, I like the crimson clover can you common graze, vetch. Graze huh? that? Yeah, yeah, you can it's not like chicken vetch uh, For the non grazers. I, I I'd like to have some of that legume component be chicken vetch, but for your grazers it could be it can be toxic, especially to horses, if it produces seed. And 90% of the cases, it will not be there long enough to produce seed, but you just never know with a long fall. I, um, other legumes, still, some guys are still going with some cowpeas just because they, boom, they come right out of the ground. They do well when it's hot. So it kind of depends on when that planting date is. If you happen to be out there and taking off peas and oats as a, as a hay crop, then I would come back maybe with some warm season broadleaves like the cowpeas in there a little bit but still include some of the cool season legumes, obviously, obviously in there. Any other questions? Okay, with that.